evening for this uh, brain food lecture. Can you imagine the next 60 years? Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Professor Graham Davis, Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, and it's my pleasure to be the facilitator this evening for this uh, uh, special lecture. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional land of the Gadigal, the people of the Aeora Nation, and to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Tonight we're pleased to have Professor Chris Lubitman here with us in Australia, together with our distinguished panel members. Tonight's format will consist of Professor Lubitman's lecture, which will be followed by responses from the panelists. Then a short question and answer time. And I'd like, you, I'd like to introduce to you briefly our panel. It's Professor Alec Tannis, Dean of the Faculty of the Built Environment here. Professor Matthew Ingman, co-director of the UNSW Climate Change Research Center, and Dr. A.D. Patterson, chief executive of Amsterdam. I've just got back from uh, China and uh, spent three weeks there, and in fact, a lot of that time was spent in the 6060 uh, anniversary celebrations of the university. That 6060 was the 60th anniversary of the University of New South Wales, but also the 60th anniversary of the People's Republic of China. Now, I don't know whose governance was based on whose, but uh, I'll leave that up to you. But we did look back on the last 60 years with much pride and saw that we'd come a long way from those few buildings that were on this site uh, probably not quite 60 years ago uh, to a world-class institution that includes six of our nine faculties being in the top 50 in the world league tables. So that's quite an achievement in a short 60 years. And I should add that, of course, engineering's in the top 30. <laughs> so where to next? Wouldn't it be great if we could look into the future and have a format for looking into the future, or at least have a view into it? Uh, I'd like to have had that view at about 3 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, in terms of the Melbourne Cup, my two are still running, I think. Tonight we have the opportunity to look forward into what life will be like in 60 years' time. And we're lucky to have Chris Lubigman with us this evening to take us on that journey. Chris has been formally educated as a geologist, structural engineer and architect. He is a scholar and a teacher, an innovator and a futurist. Chris is consulted by multinational companies as well as national governments on issues and projects relating to the future of the built environment. The European Union has also benefited from Dr. Lubigman's, I should say Professor Lubigman's, broad experience in connectivity. He was asked to be on the steering panel to help create European Construction Technology Platform, and its first activity was to develop a vision for the industry for 2030. He was also invited to advise the EU on laws to improve sustainable construction, construction, as well as on the strategic investment of research funding. As Director for Global Foresight and Innovation with the Arab Group, Chris spends most of his time and energy building a better understanding of the forces which drive global change and how these should and will impact our built environment. His current role with the Arab Group puts him at the forefront of understanding where things are heading and encourages him to think deeply about the world we are creating for our children's children. Chris is a visiting professor with us here at the Faculty of Engineering, and I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome several of Chris's colleagues who are with us tonight from the Arab Group, and thank Arabs for supporting Chris's visit to UNSW this week. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor Chris Lubigman to take us on this journey for the next six years. Thank you very much. It is a great pleasure to be back in Sydney. This time my trip was a bit easier as I only had to come from San Francisco rather than from London. And now that as I'm a visiting professor here, it'll be a much easier flight. On 14 hours you actually get an eight hour slug to sleep in contrast to coming from London and you get two 14 hour flights and you end up sitting in Singapore for a while. Tonight, I'm not going to be talking about 
gene technology and splicing, garage technology, mashing and bashing. We're talking more about frameworks for thinking. Because essentially, what my job is and has become is like this little cartoon here. I think we all know Winnie the Pooh, hopefully. And here's or Edward Bear coming down the stairs behind Christopher Robin. As far as he knows, the only way of coming downstairs. But he really thinks there must be a better way if he could just stop bumping for a minute and think of it. We get very good at bumping. All of us do. Whether in a university, a large corporation, staying at home, doing our own thing, we get very good at bumping. And so tonight, we're going to take on this Melbourne Cup Day, take a few minutes out to stop bumping and to think a little bit about how that future might be. What do we want that future to be? How can we see that? That's essentially what we're going to do. But I'd like to start with a brief story. Um, how many of you know what clay pigeon shooting is? Trap and skeet, right? So when I grew up, uh, I grew up in the middle of the, of the United States in Cincinnati, Ohio. My grandfather was an inventor. And just about 60 years ago, he patented the machine which throws those little things up in the air. And I had a very good life growing up in a small family business in the middle of, Ohio, uh, the, middle of the country uh, in which I never needed anything. I wanted lots of things, <laughs> as any kid would, but I never really needed anything. I grew up in a family where my grandfather was never happy with that product. He was always looking to improve it somehow. Never satisfied that the angle was right and it had to be something different. Which was essentially the backbone of middle class development. A small family business that developed something that was based on necessity. Because when my father, or excuse me, when my grandfather, Grandpa George, was growing up, it was his job to bring a bird or a, a four-footed animal of some kind home to, so they could have a pretty good meal. That's what he did. And the trap and skeet was to practice in the off season. I was in Cincinnati a couple days after the big trucks came to take away all the machines that I had grown up with, the press brakes, the drills, the smells. Because it was no longer viable for my father to have that small business in the hunting industry with his, final, his last two or three employees. And so it was sold and the, the entire operation was shipped off to China where it was a lot less expensive to make those products. He sold the whole company. And it was really quite interesting for me to be there, purely by chance, two days after that occurred, to think of the memories. But also to think of what does it mean to provide for a better life? Because all of you are here, hopefully, tonight to think of what will that future be? Will it be a better future? Will it be a lesser future? Because as each generation moves, you wish that the succeeding generation will have a better life. And now we're looking at the next couple of generations. Will they have a better life? Will they have a better world? My grandfather never finished university. My grandmother did. She got two degrees. Grandpa didn't. He went to work on roads to build roads. My father finished university, and I've got three degrees. My grandfather was home all the time. He literally married the woman that he grew up with from around the corner. My father married his high school sweetheart, and I married a woman who was from the other end of the continent. My father was home every day when I got home from school. He attended every single one of my sports events, and I played soccer and basketball and all those things that a strapping young lad might. I'm home two weeks a month. I travel the world today. My kids grew up in London. I grew up in Cincinnati. Who has a better life? And what will the lives be that we're creating for those next generations? What will my daughter on the right-hand side have in her world? And that is fundamentally what drives me to talk about what we're going to be talking about tonight, which is a framework for thinking about the future. What is that definition of normal? What will normal be? in another 50, 60 years. 
Because all of us have a perception of what normal is. Normal is what is in your life. That's the only place that it is normal. Right? Because the world is full of change. It always has been, and it always will be. Change is fundamentally a constant. It's that delta. What's fascinating to me is not just change, but the rate of change and the context of change. Because change is constant, and we see different kinds of change. How many of you got to fly into Hong Kong when it was really fun? Right? For those of you who did, I just have to point this out, right? And those of you who didn't, this is the approach to Hong Kong, the way it used to be. And this is how you came in, and you'd say you did a 87 degree right hand turn to get into Kai Tak. And while you were coming in, you were landing in between apartment buildings. You could look out, out the right hand side and see people doing their laundry, cooking, and everything else. It was one of the most hair rising, and even my hair stood on end, experiences that you could ever imagine. That change occurred every single time. There was never one accident that was predictable. That's one kind of change when we're thinking, looking into the future. In Tanzania, we humans built roads inside the national parks so that we can go visit those places, pay lots of money to see these beautiful animals. And we were there one time and we were looking at these, this is a workshop we led, we were looking at these giraffes, big beautiful brown eyes, confronting each other, and finally the giraffe moved off into the brush, and we could go on. Now it's very interesting because you can think, well, if you're a giraffe, where would you rather walk? Would you rather walk on this road, which has been created for you, or walk in the brush, which is scratching your legs? Well, the giraffes, of course, prefer to walk on the roads now. So we have changed their future forever. Their migratory patterns are now altered to walk our roads not their roads. Another kind of change which is impacting us for the future is this. When you fly over the Atlantic, you get to see the summer ice, the winter ice disintegrating in the summer. It's when the actual climate change becomes visceral for a northern hemispherian. To feel that ice cap disintegrating underneath you is actually quite a phenomenal experience. A change which we never intended, but is occurring daily. And finally, a change which allows us to read the past. Here a fort built on the Vauban, this is near Amsterdam, flying out of Amsterdam to the east. A fort built on the principles of Vauban when cannons became real and no one could imagine anything else. The footprints of various, com various communities showing us time physically manifested over time. We can read that. If we had stood in Tokyo in that village 500 years ago and said to the village elders, could you imagine one day that your city, your village will be, your fishing village will be the largest city in the world with towers as far as you can see, when you stand in the middle of Tokyo, you cannot see the end of it. Could he have imagined that? Can we imagine what Sydney will look like in another 500 years? Could it ever look like Tokyo? The village elders would have said, no way. They first of all would have asked, what's a city? They couldn't have imagined what was to come. In Sydney, in 1880, the Sydney Harbor, if you would have stood there with the sailors and the settlers and asked, could you imagine that one day the entire world will know of your town? Not because you think it's really cool, because they all do. Because of the icons that the whole world knows, irrefutably, because of the bridge and the opera house. They would have said, no way. What's that? When I think about change, I like to think about what's driving change. When we're thinking about the future, we have to think about what's driving us into the future. And what we try to do to think about change as a, a variable context. Because as I said before, change is constant, but the context of change is deeply variable. 
And it's that variation which has to help us try to wonder, how do we think about it? Well, I try to think about this future and what we need to be thinking about using what I call the steep categories, to order our thinking, not just to focus on the future of technology, the future of society, the future of politics, but on all five of those. And we could do a wonderful talk on the future of any one of them, but to really robustly think about tomorrow, you need to have a dialogue about all of those. And that is crucial. So I'm just going to touch on one thing of these five before I get into what I call the slingshot, and that's population. This is probably the most fundamentally important issue that drives the viability of any and every society. A society needs people. If we don't have people, we don't have a society. That's kind of self-evident, right? If you take a look at this on the left-hand side, we see China from 1950 to 2050. And here, these are all the guys, and these are all the girls. These are called population pyramids. If you've never seen one, go Google them, or Yahoo, or whatever you do, and take a look at them. They're really quite fascinating. It's extremely difficult to find the pyramids on Australia, but lots of other countries. These are little babies, and those are old folks. These are little bands, like three to four years, sometimes five years, zero to five, five to 10, 10 to 15, all the way up. This is typically magnitude or percentage. So these are girls, and these are boys, and you take a look at these other countries. It's the same thing. 1995 to 2050, America, Mexico, Emirates, Botswana. Look at the difference. So when you have a big bell jar or a decanter, you've got lots of kids. When you have lots of kids, that means you've got lots of people who can work for you, for your future if you're older. When you have a pyramid like this, I say in China, in 1950, you take a look at that pyramid. It's an amazingly steep pyramid. And it's very easy to respect your elders when there aren't a whole lot of them sitting around. When you have a whole lot of old people around you've got to take care of, you have a whole new situation. And I mean absolutely no disrespect to the Chinese. You know, but there, when you have a whole lot of old people around, what do you do? Right? So this is a fascinating thing. So the, the creation and the design of the pyramid impacts our future tremendously. And if you take a look at this, this is Italy. This is Italy. And look at this. This is this huge bulge in the middle. They're, they have no babies. You know the whole thing about Italian lovers? I don't know. You know? They don't know. They got no babies. In France, you get paid to have a second one. You got no babies. In Russia, there was a national holiday to make babies. Right? You got the day off if you went and made a baby. That was really amazing, right? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what they exactly called that day, but, right? But here you have, a, and this bump goes on through, it gets very old. This is Botswana. This is without AIDS and with AIDS, right? And look at this. When you have no youth, you have no future. It's very, it's frightening, actually. And you take a look at a couple other countries. I looked, looked at some which are very close. To think about our future, we also have to think about our neighbors, whether we like it or not. Indonesia, 2050. This is the future for Indonesia, the future for New Zealand. Not so many young people. When you don't have young people around, who's going to do the work? Who's going to change the beds in the hotel? All right? And this is a very fascinating thing. The United States would not be viable without the, all of the workers who slip over the border every, every day. All right? And look at Indonesia in 2050. Amazing. What about, oh, this is what I did. I took Indonesia and did it to scale. This is New Zealand, and this is, uh, I just go back one. There is, see, these are two different scales. This is millions, and this is thousands. So you put it into scale. This is Indonesia, and this is New Zealand. All right? And now, you, we kind of chuckle at that. But this is a very real thing. When you have a population that's growing or getting younger, like Pakistan or, not Indonesia, Pakistan, Mexico, getting younger, where are they going to go? It's an extremely important issue when you're looking at your neighbors. Australia, this is today, this is in the future. Two different scales. This is thousands, this is millions, but still, this is, and there's a very interesting paper which I read, put, put together by the government from about five years ago, talking about how you design your population pyramid. And there's like four or five different theories put forward as what one should do with Australian immigration policy, which ha basically has to do about this, or babies, you can start paying them more babies or something. But you have to have this use. So it's very interesting, and this impacts everything, absolutely everything. Food, 
buildings, needs, all across the board. If you take a look at what's happened in Australia over the past 100 years, from 1950 to about today, projected, you can see again, when you have a society that has lots of youth, you have a lots of future. When you don't have a whole lot, you need to figure out how you're going to adjust that to make it change. So let's take a look then. If we take a look and go back, back. I had, this is kind of fun for me. I went back to 1949. I kind of wish I had one of those. But I know I don't, and I'm not sure. Any of you have a Holden from 1949? There's got to be somebody in here. No? What are they called, the FJs or FXs or something? No? No one has one? Ah, beautiful. OK, so we take a look at the world in 1949. What was going on in the world? This is only 60 years ago. 60 years ago, there are only 2.3 billion people in the world today. How, you know how many are on the planet today? About 6.3, 6.4. It's almost, th almost three times as many people today in 60 years. And of those 60, of those 2.3, London was the largest city in the world, Tokyo today. New York, Tokyo, Moscow was the fourth largest. It's not even on the league table anymore from a city size. 60 years ago, the United Nations said of the 800 million children in the world, 480 million were undernourished. 60 years later, we're not doing much better. How will we be in another 60 years? 60 years ago, as was already said by Graham, the People's Republic of China was founded, as well as five years ago, Bundesrepublik Deutschland, Vietnam, Ireland, Jordan, and Indonesia. It was a bumper year for countries. Borders change a lot. Try to think of what the borders might look like in another 50, 60 years. How long will the nation state exist? Right? If we go back 60 years, and these are all founded, I really question what the, whether we're going to have the nation state as it exists now in another 50, 60 years. I doubt it. 60 years ago, apartheid was introduced. 60 years ago, the world was full of Coke, chocolate. This is a television from 1949, which until I did it, I didn't even know they existed. That's my own ignorance. I don't, I don't even own a television, so there you go. Fashions were kind of fun. I like those. 50, 60 years ago, Christian Dior was making beautiful dresses, and sadly, Budweiser beer was still sold, was being sold in America. I am sorry about that. It hasn't changed much in 60 years. 60 years ago, Rodgers and Hammerstein came out with South Pacific 60 years ago, Arthur Miller, Pulitzer Prize winning Death of a Salesman, 1984. Big Brother is watching you, now it's a television show. Right? 60 years ago, Chagall was active as a painter. Wonderful, beautiful work, Richard Strauss died. 60 years ago, fuel rationing was just coming to an end in England. Australia was crazy about the Queen. The, the Korean Peninsula was starting to boil. Sixty years ago, NATO treaty was just being signed. Sixty years ago, the Comet, the first really commercial long-distance aircraft, was brought into the market. That was only 60 years ago. They crashed a lot. <laughs> they didn't do so well in the beginning, but <laughs> beautiful, beautiful jets. Also 60 years ago, there's this great thing called the aero car, which I have to show you a little clip from the time. How many of you want one? <laughs> right now, just imagine the traffic in the sky as crazy as the traffic on the ground. Right? I'm not so sure about it. But every generation seems to be into this idea of the flying car. And it's a really great question and has been posed for, for hundreds of years, not for hundreds, but for dozens of years now. Will we have this vehicular traffic of the sky? Will we have that? I, I don't know. 
Go back and look at Sydney in 1949. 60 years ago, there was no opera house. Arab hadn't done his, his gig there. Been a long point, was a, a tram shed, a bit of a park. The passenger terminal looked slightly different. Harbor Bridge still there. Harbor Bridge, 1932, right? The San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge, 1937. Two sides of the Pacific, got bridge, two beautiful bridges at the same time. Bakelite was in, right? We had the Bakelite phone. This is for all those who'd never, all those youngsters in here, this is what, a dial. <laughs> when you dial a phone, when your parents or grandparents say, go dial the phone, that's what we did, right? Can you imagine another 50, 60 years that we're actually not even have to say anything? Maybe we'll just think about it, and it'll happen. Wouldn't it be awful to actually be able to have your thoughts transferred? I mean, we could, there's been research doing on trying to get neurons to connect to electrons, and it's, it's happening. It's just that our brain rejects the connections after about two, three hours, but they've already been able to do that with nerves, so we can make that happen. Sixty years ago, the women who weren't on the telephone were either on the beach looking for the guys or the guys looking for the girls, and cricket in the back alleys being played. This gentleman was just ending his career at that time, very well known. Many of his records, Sir Donald Bradman, still stand. George Street had a slightly different look. Trams, which might come back, pretty efficient way of moving people around. At the George Street at the Rocks, had a little different feel. I guess Murdoch was doing his thing already. Uh, distribution of the newspapers, whole different look to the truck and the system. Readership of most newspapers are down, and I was reading in the States, by 25%, which is fascinating in the past few years. 25% is a huge number, no matter how you've got any business. It's a question of how long they'll be viable at all as a physical form. And in the newspapers, 60 years ago, it was talking about energy, wrecks, <laughs> holidays. And I liked this one, this dwindling coal stock. And I, and I thought that was really quite fascinating, especially with peak oil now passed. You know, it's kind of two years ago we passed the peak, so with our dwindling oil in the world, now what will we do? Right, we still got lots of oil left, but now what? Quite fascinating to think about that. And there's a lot of talk about communism in the world at this time of the year, at this time of history, <laughs> not this time of the year. Um, Truman was the president of the United States. He was going on very soon to em embark upon the witch hunts. And here, Mr. Chiefly and the communists had the same objective, socialization. It's quite fascinating there to be feared. Sydney's big town plan still awaits state action. <laughs> I guess things haven't changed much <laughs> in 60 years, but I'll let you work on that. I don't know. Uh, sometimes you kind of wonder if everyone in Los Angeles um, 100 years ago would have actually had some zoning and planning, whether it ended up as it looks today with this urban vomit. Um, and you kind of really wonder about that when looking to the future. If Los Angeles or Las Vegas, Denver, sit, you know, different cities around the world will continue their, their spread gobbling up the land. And I also like this one, and this, the guys in our office were great, and they gave this to me from Sydney, and I wasn't quite sure about this one. <laughs> Academic visitors make our university feel its poverty, and I thought that was exactly not what I was um, wanting on the news. And six years ago, the last one, a Sydney horse won the cup. Just to let you know, gallant Fox Zemi, a Sydney four-year-old, won the Melbourne Cup. And it was also on November 2nd, which I thought was a bit eerie, frankly. But there you go. So that was Sydney 60 years ago. And 60 years ago, people were also thinking about the future, right? This is the commuter copter. It was going to be thought of how we were going to be commuting today, actually. 60 years ago, we were all going to be running around in bubble cars, kind of like the Prius. We we're also going to have man-made sea legs, which is really quite fascinating, of course, for our various freighters. This beautiful mechanization, because in that time, you could still see what needed to be done. Right? Engineering was about physical things, not virtual things. Space, the new frontier, was yet to be conquered. The vision to go out 
and to explore. Different nations were looking at their, po their programs. Women were going to be shopping over this kind of thing called the television. So here we have internet shopping. And the thing I absolutely love is this. I have two kids. In London, when I used to live there, they used to go to, they used to walk to school in the rain, and they never smiled. <laughs> never. I mean, you know, that was not the thing you did. And they didn't even have umbrellas. That was totally uncool. So maybe that was a different world. But that was going to be our vision for tomorrow. Also, 60 years ago, this was going to be the kitchen. We were going to have griddles that was built into the counters, pedals which would open up, pedals which would open up the different different compartments. Who knows how you clean the things? And this is to wash your dishes and do your toast. It was all going to be built in. And we were going to be building cities like New York that had covers. Because of this wonderful thing right here, you can read, we can now make a climate to order. Now, maybe in another 60 years, we will desperately need to do this. Right? And I, and I sincerely hope not. I have great fears for that. But I think this is fascinating to think that even 60 to 100 years ago, we believed that we could alter our climate beneficially. Quite fascinating. 60 years ago, women were going to turn into Amazons. Right? This was interesting from Nebraska. And Salute to the Future from Robots. This is at the time when Mark Turing published the, basically his treatise, his paper, which ended up being the Turing test for machine intelligence. How do you know when a machine is actually intelligent? Right? Fascinating to look at that. And there was an expert who in 1949 wrote in this great article all about what our lives are going to be like today. And I wanted just to highlight a couple, because I just had to show a couple here. I could do the whole thing, but we're not. First of all, education, more college grads. Compared to 1949, we're definitely on that track, right? Labor, a short work week. How are we doing on that one? Any good? Now. That's very interesting to think of that. Every generation and every, every iteration tells us we're going to get better and better and better, more uh, efficient, more effective, and yet our work week keeps getting longer. And can you imagine over the next 60 years, it's going to get smaller. Uh, maybe freedom is going to survive. That's quite, I, I'm not quite so sure I believe that for uh, when we look at climate change. Aviation, foolproof flying. Uh, I'm not quite sure what they mean by that either, but perhaps they, they did it. It's all about new, they're talking atomic driven airplanes. This is going to be that future. And the one I love the most is the push button home. That you're going to be able to push buttons to make everything happen at home. And we're almost there with intelligent buildings. So a few things they got right, a few things we didn't at all. The future is fundamentally fiction. Right? It's fiction. The future is fiction, and depending on what genre of fiction you like to write, you can write a story for tomorrow. And it's quite fascinating to me, so therefore you're never wrong, you're never quite right. If we look back at yesterday's visions of tomorrow, you'll see wonderful things. How many of you saw Blade Runner when it came out? Do you remember what year was Blade Runner presented to be? Anybody remember? 2026. 2026 is within a stone's throw now. And that was the far future when it was created. Absolutely the far future. So what I prefer not to do is talk about the fiction of tomorrow, but actually to try to think of what we call plausible futures. And so what I'd like to do is to share with you some of the thinking that we've been doing on, on what some plausible futures might look like for us. And I'm going to give you four worlds. And I want you to think, I'm going to give you those four worlds, to, I'm going to have you to vote on which world do you think we're going to head into first? Okay, so you have to pay attention in a few minutes. And what we've done is we've juxtaposed two axes. One is human development, and the other is planetary health. Because it's interesting is we are on a planet that supports us. The oceans make our oxygen. We are on this planet. So what we need to really look at is HDI, which is a combination of three, three fundamental factors. One is essentially life expectancy, how well we're doing with giving birth. The second is, is, about, is about the health of a, of a population, of a group. The second is illiteracy. Is literacy, are we educating our population? And the third is about the standard of living or GDP. Most of the time, 
we just, most people just look at GDP, but the HDI is really the right thing to be looking at. So we've got better or worse. The next is planetary health. And we chose that because planetary health, as I said, is a system which allows us to survive. And it's, a, it's built by a four or five factors. Species, which in the paper today, there's it, it an article saying that one third of the planetary species are under threat of extinction within the next 50 years. I, I just can't, can't quote. Biodiversity, pollution, abundance, and fertility. So this is really about the planet's ca carrying capacity. So if we juxtapose these, we get four different worlds. Oops. One is called the selfish bubble. The second, carbon is crime. The vortex of despair and the ecological age. So I'm going to describe each, each one of these. Now, each one of these is perfectly plausible. None of them are perfect. So when we're thinking about future scenarios, it's, it's fiction. So you have to go with each one of these. I want you just to, again, think about which one you think we're heading into first. All right? So the first one is what we call the selfish bubble. The selfish bubble is where the human system on the planet is in a very good state. Right? But the planetary systems are not doing so well. It's a world in which we have continued growth. Growth is our mantra. Lots of urban growth, rural depopulation. We have generally environmental degradation. Because of our consumption of resources, we focus on ourselves, not on our environment around us. And we, we can get pretty good at that. Technology increases. We get really great fixes. Carbon sequestration might or might not work. Inflation starts to hit a little bit, but that's OK. But the ego is more important than the community. We build things, more and more things like this on the top right, the tallest tower in the world, the Burj, the Lock. The emphasis, and intellectually, is on technology fixes, not societal fixes. Middle class commercialism booms. High levels of CO2 emissions. Our energy and water shortages continue to increase because it's, about, it's all about growth. It's all about consumption. OK? That's one. The second one is what we call the vortex of despair. In this world, fossil fuels are being used rampantly. We haven't figured out that those emissions are really worth trying to do something about. Mass migration becomes commonplace. Because the planetary systems are so unhealthy, you have like the herd mentality for survival. So you pe people moving, and yet, Society, as a whole, due to its lack of funds, does not really take care of the weak, the infirm, or the elderly. So you have increasing die-offs. Education takes a second rung. Global governance fundamentally breaks down, and so you have much more bartering, bilateral agreements, and resource grabbing. Right? It's a hard place to live. It's a very hard place to live. Social cohesiveness is more important than diversity. Your clan, your community, those who are like you are more important than the diversity of a healthy community. So it becomes really this fortress mentality. And I'm assuming everyone's reading while I'm talking as well. Are we doing okay with that? Yeah. All right. Carbon is crime. It's a third world. Here, governance has been strengthened. COP 15 is signed. COP 16 said we've got actually a whole series of agreements which are in place because there's a global recognition that we have to do something. Otherwise, our planetary systems, which support us, are going to implode and create a problem for us. So, the human condition is less important than a planetary condition. So we put all of our effort, if you will, into saving planet Earth, spaceship Earth, and to the detriment of, of, of people, if you will, the plague. We're looked at as a plague on the planet. So we've got lots of um, emission-free technologies, lots of zoning and planning, densification. We have an extreme wealth gap between the rich 
and the poor. The rich are even further out than they are now. They gate themselves, they take care of themselves, and they really don't care about the rest. All right? it's, 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 a, it's a very strange place. You've got the eco-terrorist, you've got eco-warism. Cradle-to-cradle mentality, total life costing becomes mandatory. Just like you have your food labels, now we've got the, the resource labels on everything. The last world is the ecological age. The ecological age is one in which emissions have been stopped, if you will. Our, the growth in our greenhouse gases has stopped. is decarbonizing. We're getting a little bit out. Circular economies, just as in the five-year plan, which was just uh, published from China, they're actually being practiced globally. There is no such thing as garbage. It's all resource. We've realized that we have to be living within our means, and there, but the means allow us to continue to live. Resource efficiency is expected. There's a, there's a new, you know, this is, this is what we all hope to get to, right? This is da 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 da. So it's a small world after. It's just, you know, this is right, that's where. So this is that ecological age, and it's probably we can all kind of imagine what that might be. So those are the four worlds. Should I go back really quickly to show you those four? Because I want you to just a show of hands which one you think we're heading into right now, right? So I'm going to go back to do the four. So we've got selfish bubble, carbon is crime, vortex of despair, and the ecological age, right? I'm going to flash you the pictures so you can have a visual image of each of those just for a minute. The selfish bubble, come on. Selfish bubble, vortex of despair, well, wait, don't vote yet. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you when to put your hands up. Just a second. Hold on. Carbon is crime and ecological age. Now, we're going to go and do the hands. How many think we're, I need them high because it's kind of funny light in here. How many think we're heading into the, into the selfish bubble? Uh, I'm not going to count, but we're going to just kind of get a general feel for the room. Selfish bubble? All right. How many think we're heading into the vortex of despair? Fewer? Okay. How many think we're heading to carbon as crime? About the same as the previous one. And how many think we're heading into the ecological age? <laughs> now remember, this is where you think we're heading, not where you think we, we not where you want to go. That's the next question, right? So you think we're heading there. Okay, so of this group, of this group, you guys clearly think. We're heading here. This is an overruling by about four to one. This was the second one. That was the third one. And this was, oopsie, this was the last one. Right? Uh, although that was the most vocal one. <laughs> now, that's kind of interesting uh, and challenging for us because that means that we, we believe that in the next years that the planetary health will continue to degrade. And that's probably over the next 30 to 40 to 50 years. Now, of, of all four, is there anyone in here who doesn't really want us to get to the ecological age? No? You wouldn't dare put your hand up right now anyway, would you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> there you go. There's a contrarian up front. Yeah, yeah, I got that. Okay. But this is interesting, right? So if we believe we're heading to the selfish bubble, what are the things we need to be doing to make sure we get to that ecological age? Do, do you have a vision of what that might even look like? Have you thought about it? Is there a vision for Sydney, a vision for Australia in the ecological age? Do you know what it really is? How many liters of water we can use or not? I don't know. So those are our four plausible futures. And I very wonder when we're in this tunnel, which we all are, in our various normal normalities around the world, what will be at the end of it? Right? What would the end of that tunnel look like for South Africa? What would it look like for New Zealand, for Australia, for China, for Tibet, for the United States? What does that end of that tunnel look like? Right? I don't know. One thing I hope it doesn't look like is this. Right? I hope it doesn't look like this. But when the, when the 101, this is actually Photoshop. I can, right? It's pretty good, though, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's really convincing. Eh? There are some freeways in Los Angeles which approach this. There really are. But I also believe that if we knew now, if we knew now, 
If we knew then what we know now, I wonder, would we make the same decisions? Can you think of the scenarios where Sydney would have an archery like this? No? And Los Angeles couldn't think of it either, guaranteed, when the commissioners sat down to plan their first highway. What about on the East Coast? Can you imagine the East Coast Highway that's 12 lanes wide in another 10, 20, 30 years? If you don't imagine it, maybe you should, and think of what an alternative might be. So, Because to me, the question becomes, what is normal? When we're thinking of the future, the first thing, as I started, is what's normal? Right? So this is a holiday park, and it looks like a lot of fun. All right? You go there, you get a wave machine on the right-hand side, you get the beach, and the interesting thing is, it's right next to the beach. Right? Now, it is fairly amusing, but think about, really think about this. Right? Can we now have 6 billion people? When this university was founded, there were 2.3 billion. There's supposed to be 9 billion people on the planet. Can all 9 billion visit the beach? Right? It's a really deep question to think about. Do, we, do you want all 9 billion? To, is it their right? to visit the beach. Right? And now part of me says, of course it is, right? But the other part of me says, no way. Not your beach, <laughs> right? And not your beach. But, but it's a really interesting question when you're thinking about the future. What will normal be? Perhaps nine billion people can go in here, but they cannot go out here. This is the world you know. This is a normal wave. And this is a world of nature which you never know what you're going to get. Right, it's a really interesting paradox, that one. Fascinating for me, really fascinating. Will it be? It was once normal in Hong Kong to have a taxi with two skins on its roof. It's brilliant. The most clever double skin facade in the world. Right? Because heat comes through the skin of the roof. If you didn't have two roofs there, you could put your finger underneath the roof and boil an egg on it. You could burn yourself. Simply putting that, that little second roof with an air gap of an inch keeps all the radiant heat from coming into that taxi so those poor guys waiting on the stand don't fry. Why doesn't... It's like an umbrella. That's a taxi with an umbrella. It's an awning. When I grew up in Cincinnati, every year in the springtime, we put the screens in and the awnings in, on, and we took out the storm windows. Right? That's what we did. How many houses have awnings anymore? How many houses have umbrellas around them to keep the heat out? It's really fascinating when you think about the future and future needs to go back to the future, to look back at some of those most simple things which we have forgotten. And this is one of those. All the new taxes in Hong Kong do not have a second roof because it's looked at as something that's old and no longer cool. I think these are the things we've got to get to when we go back to the future. Ecological age. I was in Melbourne, and I didn't know that dogs in Melbourne all shat in bags. I thought that was quite fascinating, actually. No, seriously. I was in Melbourne uh, having coffee with some PhD students on the square right outside my hotel, and I looked over, and I saw this dog doing his business or her business in a plastic bag, right? I looked at that, and my jaw, you had to catch it off the table. It was really fascinating, right? And then I walked, and the dog walked off, and she went over, <laughs> down the stairs, and, and, you know, down the stairs, and I, I, did, I had to stand up to take this picture, right? Went over to a garbage can and deposited the bag. She got down, took the bag off, deposited the bag with the poop, in the garbage can. And I thought, I looked at that, and I, I was amazed. And then I was talking to a friend who um, had leukemia uh, when, uh, when they were young, lost every bit of hair on their entire body. And we were talking about this, and, and what, what they said was, you know, she just wants to be normal. She just wants to be seen as normal. When you're, when you're different, like, all you want to be is normal and for people to treat you normally. And I thought to myself, so she thinks it's normal that you take care of your business. 
that you take care of your dog's poop. You're not going to litter. You're not going to do this because it's not normal, to, if you will, to do that to your city. And I thought that was really quite, I'm, I'm reading into this, right? But I thought it was really quite fascinating, this perception of, of, of a woman who is blind because it's a seeing eye dog who anyone would sit there and look at that person and say, ah, it's fine. Let your dog poop. You're blind. You can't go and get it. It's fine. But of course not. She wants to contribute. And with me, in order to move into the future, into the ecological age, we all have to have an attitude of taking care of our communities, to taking care of our places and spaces and caring like that. This is Trafalgar Square. It was there after an event. And here's a garbage can, which clearly everyone could read who stuffed something in it. But they couldn't read enough to care to put the right stuff in the right bin. This is the selfish bubble. So here you have a blind woman who really wants to do the right thing, and here you have people who are seeing and they couldn't care to do the right thing. And you have to think again as we move into the next 60 years, that attitude of, I could do the right thing, but I really don't care to. I'll do it tomorrow. Right? Very interesting to me. I was hiking in Aspen, walking down Aspen Mountain, and I came across this bottle, and it was sitting there. Fiji water. A bottle of Fiji water in Aspen, Colorado. I just was dumbfounded that someone would, first of all, buy Fiji water in Aspen. But secondly, they would just throw away a bottle that's full. It's not even consumed. Here's this water come all the way from Fiji, up the mountain, halfway down the mountain, just sitting there. If I couldn't think of a better manifestation as an emblem for the selfish bubble like, than that, I didn't, couldn't think of anything. The vortex of despair. Each of these, each of these examples, each of these worlds exists today. Our future is here. It's just unevenly distributed. I was in Amman, Jordan, a few weeks ago, and I had the privilege of meeting with the Crown Prince and his daughter, the Royal Highness to talk about doing some futures work with the, with, the, with the country. And I get into the car because Princess Honey says, I want to take you to see my city. I said, great. So we arrive, I arrive, and I get there, and I jump in the car, and here's this machine pistol at my knee. That's my knee. Now, it's not normal for me to jump in a car and have a machine pistol at my knee. It's, it's, not, it's clearly been used. It's not new. And it was not fake, right? And I thought to myself, fascinating. Really, you can't really choke at that moment. You've just got to go with it, <laughs> right? <laughs> we did. But this vortex of this despair where people will do anything to survive. You're at the base of the pyramid where what you're really looking for is shelter and food and to care for your loved ones. That exists in basically two-thirds of the planet, those who don't have what we have. And then when we look to the future, will this vortex of despair disappear? We went and visited the Palestinian refugee camps that had been there since the 1950s, individuals who had lived their whole lives there. Or Tanzania in the countryside, another vortex of despair on our planet today. A wonderful example of where we could all be heading over the next 60 years if we're not vigilant. Where one will do anything to survive. In Copenhagen or Frankfurt Airport, and if you're a smoker, carbon is crime is your world. Right there, those are smoking cabins. And I remember flying when the, the, the non-smoking and the smoking section was separated by a little flag <laughs> that moved, depending on how many people like, signed in and wanted smoking and non-smoking. 
And I remember vividly on Icelandic air flying back from Switzerland one day when, man, I was right on that last row. And, and I, I, you know, I probably lost five years off my life, you know, that, on that flight. Right? And today, and today, we have car cigarette and smoke. Carbon is crime right here. And I thought that was a really a wonderful example of where we begin to count, we begin to measure everything. And I wonder how far can that go? Where would it go? Where would you want, what would you want to be counted? Right? And how would we count that? Because our dilemma is fundamentally this one. When we're looking to the future, it's fundamentally like this, the driver of the cement, the concrete mixer. I was in Chicago going to a meeting, and I'm at a, at a stoplight at a red light, and this mixer stops with a smoking tire. Now, where there's smoke, there's fire, right? This guy, this chap, this guy in the driver, reached it, he, he opened the door, looked out, he kind of looked down at the tire, shook his head, got back in there, drinking his coffee, <laughs> just watching his tire smoke, and the light turns green, and I'm not kidding, he went off, and he, you can see he's blinking, he's turning left. He went up, did this left turn like in a movie, this is in Chicago, they got bridges over some of the canals, he's over a little hump, I ran out into the middle of the street to watch him go over the bridge like in a movie. I have no idea what happened. I have no idea. I just stood there for a few, it's like 6.30 in the morning. I was sitting there looking and going, hmm. I, you know, I got out of the street and I started thinking about that. What should he have done? Right? If, you're, if you're the owner of this truck, right, what would you do? If you're a policeman or a policewoman, what would you want to happen? You're a public hazard. You better stop. If you're the construction foreman or forewoman, what do you want? You want that load of concrete because you've got a whole load, you've got a whole crew waiting for it. Right? So all sorts of options, and none of them are actually right. Each of them have consequences. And to me, this is where we stand when we're looking at the next 60 years. Instead of thinking about all the cool gene tech and the splicing and the medical things, all these kinds of things we can we talk about and get a lot of fun, to think about what are then the potential implications of the decisions which each one of us are making every day. Where do those vectors lead, each individually and also, if you will, nationally? Because this is each one of us, my last three slides, each one of us is essentially a sack of water, just like those water droplets. Just like the planet Earth, big sack of water, right? So here we are on this, on this leaf in my garden, and that water, could, the sun can beat down on it, and it can, be, it can evaporate and go back into the water cycle very nicely. Or a bit of energy can come by and can disturb that leaf, right? can shake that leaf up. And those water droplets flow together, and they go down to the roots and feed that plant. So then it expires, and the water gets back into the water cycle. It goes both times. But in one, it does good for the system as a whole, the plant, and the other, it doesn't. And that's what we have to be. And as an academic institution, as graduates, this is important for us, to be that energy to make those droplets come together so we actually create a positive future, the future which is ours to write. We write that every day. We need to be this little dandelion in the astroturf to make sure that the future is the one which we want it to be. So with that, <laughs> I'm going to say thank you very much. <laughs>
is a wide experience in working with government and contributing to national policy development commercialization skills. He has a successful history of technical leadership and organizational change. Next to him is Professor Matthew England, who is a professor of oceanography and co-director of the UNSW Climate Change Research Center. He's also an ARC Federation Fellow and a former Fulbright Scholar and Cyro Flagship Fellow. He was a lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, third and fourth assessment reports, and next month, Matt heads to Copenhagen to present a major new report entitled The Copenhagen Diagnostics, Diagnosis, led by the CCRC, which aims to inform policymakers, business leaders, and the wider community of the current state of knowledge in climate change science. And then finally, we have Professor Alec Tanis, who's an architect and a dean of the Faculty of the Built Environment. He's a large number of prizes to his name, including the John Schumann Prize for Architectural Design. He has studied internationally and is actively associated with architectural bodies in America, Canada, and New Zealand. Alec combines his role at the university with professional practice, and his company, Tanis Associates, has been integral to projects in architecture and urban design. His success is evident in the more than 40 industry awards his company has received. That's your panel, ladies and gentlemen. And I'd like to ask them to give three or four minutes on their response and what they see. Eddie, would you like to go first? Thank you very much, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I really enjoyed what uh, Chris had to present. It kind of is a tapestry of everything from despair to hope and from pragmatism to kind of failure of nerve. Um, and I kind of grew up in a world uh, where we were called modernists uh, and we thought that pretty much everything could be reduced to its elements and then if you add it all back up you would have a future. And then just as I started working something called postmodernism was invented which uh, basically reframed all of the questions and changed the future forever. And I was recently at a lecture where somebody told me that we are in the age of post-postmodernism, <laughs> which uh, is very difficult to describe because I never quite understood uh, postmodernism. But I want to introduce three ideas that may be important for the future. The first one is um, a discussion which some friends of mine had uh, just before I left South Africa. I've only been in Australia since the 27th of, uh, of February, so I'm, I'm brand new, and if I inadvertently offend anybody, I immediately apologize. But these two friends were talking about uh, their lives. The one is a, a top estuarine systems guy, and the other one is a, a plant taxonomist who'd spent most of his life classifying grass in South Africa. Um, and we were sitting and, and having a chat, and both of them, sort of after dinner, second glass of wine, said, wouldn't it be great if we could dispense with the notion of a species? Wouldn't it be great if we could dispense with the notion of the species? And what they were saying really is that species are something that we invented, but actually may not exist at all. So if you're spending your life trying to save species, you might be saving something that is deeply humanly inspired rather than systemically required by biology. Now I leave this thought with you. I don't want to explore it too far because I might not get to dinner. Um, but, but the idea is that if you can dispense with the notion of a species, you can start to use post-Copernican biology to actually invent a future. Uh, and I think that's an important idea. The second idea is that through all of the work of humanity up to now, the way that we've dealt with our appetite for energy is to increase the energy density and to reduce the total area that we use to produce energy so that it doesn't use up too much space. This is the first generation that we've ever had where people are trying to expand the area that we use to produce energy uh, in the hope that it will produce energy more efficiently and, and, and in a profound way. And I would say that there's some deep laws of physics and some principles of engineering that would argue that we are misguided. That's not because I come previously from a nuclear energy company, um, but it is at least, I think, worth thinking about high density energy sources remaining really important uh, for energy futures except in Australia where it's already been excluded, and so we don't need to worry about that one. So don't think about species, don't think about energy. The last one that I don't want us to think about is water. 
Um, I recently got uh, one of my colleagues sent me a thing saying that we've uh, got to stop worrying about our carbon footprint, we must think about our water f footprint. And then there was a long treatise on the consumption of water. And I sent her an email saying, when the water has been consumed, where does it go? When you've consumed the water, where does it go? Because I think we're making a false analogy between energy production, where when you've produced the energy, you've genuinely used something up because there are no real renewables. The sun is probably the best renewable source that we've got, and it's just basically a really well-organized fusion reactor that's sending us rays. Um, but there are no genuine renewables like uh, geothermal is not a genuine renewable and so on. So what happens with water when we've used it? is it becomes available somewhere else and can be reused. And I believe that one of the fundamental questions around water is the scale on which we decide to organize water for the future so that we can have much more available to us now uh, and into the future. So the last question I want to, to just raise is, is it possible that we are living in an era where we will genuinely decouple our economy uh, from all of the physical things that make it necessary to consume so much resource and genuinely make it a knowledge economy. I say this knowing that the continent that I come from, in 2032, uh, the population of Africa will overtake the population of China. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Uh, Chris, fantastic presentation. I really loved the tour of the world back in 1949. And one thing that came to my mind back then was uh, this issue of climate uh, was around back then. Uh, many of you may not know that Al Gore did not invent climate change or, or discover it. He uh, presented that film on the basis of science that's been around for over a century. And so uh, Chris's nice newspaper clipping there could have included somebody talking about uh, future projected problems with ongoing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I also think one quick comment is this, the four quadrants. I think there is a very strong pull as individuals towards the selfish box. And I experience this every day. I've got a family with three kids and I think about their health and their well-being and feeding them and giving them water and housing them and all the sorts of things that drive us towards consumption necessarily to have those outcomes for our next generation. And the psychologists tell us that a vast proportion of our brain is devoted to the here and, our, here and now, and a very small proportion is devoted to thinking 60 years hence. We floss our teeth to protect our teeth, but we don't necessarily want to change too many habits if that's going to threaten the here and now, because that's our, our strongest concern. And I think this is a very difficult dilemma, it sort of comes into some, a lot of Chris's points, that we have an overwhelming urge to, to deal with the here and now. We don't tend to want to think about many generations from hence into the future. One other comment I want to make as a climate scientist is that we're often, I'm often questioned, you know, how, how do you know where things are going into the future? How can you be confident about the climate change projections? And I'm a scientist and apologies, I bring in one slide to my response here and, and make the comment that yes, things are very uncertain. Shown here are a couple of graphs into the future, starting with 1900 and going through to 2100, so we cut through 60 years from now and go a bit further on. And up the top are our emissions and, and the red curve is more or less the, uh, one of those quadrants Chris had which is a business as usual curve, let's keep producing consuming, and, not, and importantly, let's not worry about decarbonising the technologies we, we rely on. And the blue curve is one where Copenhagen makes serious decisions. The technologists advance new low carbon technologies to power the planet and so on. And you can see these have very different climate change projections. Those two blue and red curves fanning out show the projections of temperature change for the planet, and the very dark reds in the middle are the very high probability uh, scenarios and then it fans out to progressively lower and lower probability events. Uh, for example, the red curve at the very top, we think it's unlikely the planet will warm to, se to 7 degrees Celsius by the end of this century, but it is possible without mitigating our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, worryingly, that blue curve down the bottom that corresponds to very deep 
and immediate action on greenhouse gas emission reductions delivers us some chance of staying below the two degree curve. And many of you will have heard this benchmark of avoiding two degree C warming. Uh, this is an iconic figure partly because it, it corresponds to levels of climate change that many of us think are problematic for future gener generations. It, two degrees C virtually certainly locks in the large scale disintegration of the Greenland ice sheet over many centuries. So whilst it's not going to affect our generation or even potentially our kids' generation, that, that climatic event, we're locking in uh, changes to the planet that are of a profound scale. And so I guess my quick comment is that whilst it's so hard to see the future in terms of technology, greenhouse gases have very fundamental radiative properties and we do know with certainty that, no, uh, that, that, that going on with the business as usual scenario will fundamentally change our climate system. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Chris, thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, I'm one of those people who's buried in the present, but obviously in my work, uh, always thinking about the future. And it's fantastic to have a talk which um, I took a lot away from, particularly the idea of um, frameworks for thinking and our human development and contemplating how we can change through changing ourselves. Mm. And that's what I want to talk about. But in preparing, um, in preparing for this, I, I kind of looked for things in in the world around me that might in some way intersect with what you might talk about tonight, not really knowing at all what you're going to talk about tonight, having read a brief CV, but I came across an advertisement in the um, October the 26th edition of the New Yorker, quite a good magazine, and I thought I'd read it. It's, a new, uh, it's an add-on, the, the new hybrid vehicle, the Lexus, but what it says is, Ital Cementi Innovation and Technology Central Laboratory on the, on the Milan Venice Autostrada, we will be built from TX active concrete that will eat smog and significantly reduce pollution caused by car emissions and industrial activities. The structure will use high performance, low E, low iron, insulated clear glass, and incorporate geothermal and renewable solar energy systems that pr will provide close to total energy self sufficiency. Now, that was pretty interesting, and I checked. Um, the through the internet whether this product exists and so on. It seems to have been accredited by three independent sort of reliable sources and through a lot of research it seems to be around. But I, I, I raise that not because of that product. I think I'm talking about today. But it was designed by Richard Meyer. Those in the audience who are architects hmm. would know that Richard Meyer in the 70s led the postmodern uh, concept in, in design thinking by really uh, what we would call a sort of self, a concern about self-referential language, an idea about developing something about uh, oneself, expressing oneself through an understanding of you know, architectural language. So the idea of change and change of values uh, driven by social concerns has transformed this architect from one set of uh, ideas to another set of ideas. That's why I put my hand up for an ecological future or an ecological age, because we're already thinking like that. And my last comment in, in the two or three minutes really has got more to do with this idea of human development, because again, in these sort of ramblings about what this might be about, I came across um, an artist I didn't know about, and probably many of you know about him, Stephen Wiltshire. Now, Stephen is an unusual artist because he has an MBE. Again, this is uh, uh, you know, perhaps a bit uh, wild to think of as true, but it is true. He has this ability to um, fly over, I think it was Madrid, the whole city of Madrid, in a helicopter, about a half an hour, go back to a studio, and several hours later, he's 35 years old, male, 30, several hours later, draw it from memory accurately and in perspective. And they've done tests, they put him to Trafalgar Square, sat there for a half an hour, took him away, and they videoed him drawing Trafalgar Square. And I mean everything, the statues, the signs, cars, everything in perspective. But the interesting thing is that Stephen is autistic and he didn't speak till he was five and then the first thing he kind of they got out of him was he wanted to draw and they began to develop uh, his language by um, providing him drawing tools if he spoke, as I understand. I'm probably not putting that very well. And what we're now beginning to understand is that uh, perhaps um, autistic people have a way of thinking. I first thought of it when I read this and saw, saw videos and so on. I thought, well, 
gee, he must be able to kind of, you know, I can draw perspective, I, he must have a picture plane in his head that he can sort of see through and just draw it, you know. But it may be something like that, but it probably isn't. And what people are beginning to think about is ways of thinking which um, produce a logical thought, you know, can, can develop thought patterns which are not to do with using language. And they say, it, well, some people in research are saying it might give some insight into how autistic people think and, in fact, how a lot of animals think. Now, my point was more along the line of what would the world be like if we developed our powers of thinking, what, we, we would, what, we would, be, uh, what would be a future if we could not only think the way we normally think, but be able to harness such extraordinary human powers. Now, I mean, for me, this was, uh, you know, I can draw a little bit. And to see someone, I mean, I can be shown, I can be, I've been in front of something for about three hours and trying to draw it, and I still get it wrong. But this fellow is able to draw it from memory and very complex. So the idea for me really captured my imagination, the power of this person's brain to be able to deliver that fascinated me and gave me hope for a future, a way of incorporating ways of thinking which we don't really fully harness today. And of course it has consequences, significant consequences to values because say, say for example, we understand how animals think more effectively, we begin to value them, we begin to think of them differently, we probably won't eat as many of them, we'll probably have a better environment as a result of that, certainly better health. So I would say um, this idea about the future is, is something to do with developing ourselves and, and really focusing on what, what this can mean to uh, really address the sort of issues that Chris has so clearly identified. Hi, um, it's, it's a question actually for Chris. Um, after you showed us all the different worlds and you're looking at the measurement tool and you looked at GDP, do you think maybe then we need to look at a different measurement tool because obviously that's not really measuring a good standard of living? Um, you know, when, okay, there's two parts to the answer. And the first part is there's no, to me there's no wrong way to be framing thinking about tomorrow as long as we're as long as one's doing it All right? because we get in, in, a, in a, because very often we don't think about the next 5 10 20 30 40 years so if, even if we're starting that process of thinking about the next 50 years that's a great step that's the first part to that question the second is gdp is part of the the hdi <laughs> like that lingo so gdp is just one of the three makeups of the human development index and i feel that's a much better way of assessing the health of a society than purely the productive capacity of, that we're measuring right now. And we all know if you measure, whatever you measure, you work towards. This is, you know, if you, in faculty, if you measure the amount of research dollars you get, then all the faculty will do is try to get research dollars. If you measure the effectiveness of teaching, then they'll start teaching. I mean, it's, I used to be a professor, so I can say that, right? And so it's really interesting. In a, in a company, if you measure the number of hours you work versus the productivity, you, you know. So what we measure Im impacts how we also behave. So I think GDP is a good measure, but it's not the only one. And if all we look at is GDP, then it's a false picture. You've got energy or electricity traditionally shows an increase in wealth, an increase in health and well-being. Two is education. And we're all around the world in the societies that we live in, around the whole world, being educated more. Education is now being instantaneous. News is instantaneous. Everything is instantaneous around the world. The effect of what is happening in any part of the world is beamed around the rest of the world for immediate response and thought and counteraction. The last one comes back to then this feel good part. As educated people that are now living in a better environment because of electricity and, and sanitation and 
water and all of these things, we, we have all got a social conscience. And that social conscience is being honed and honed up. And for that reason, I'd prophesize that the last quadrant is the one that will happen. So, did you have a question? Or was it a statement? Yeah. For comment. For comment. <laughs> oh, okay. Good. I'd be happy to comment on the electricity thing because uh, having spent some time in, in Australia, I realize that uh, the electricity is, is cheap and it's really widely available. And even if the price trebled, it would still be cheap and would be widely available. Even if it went up six times, it would be cheap and widely available. Because until you've lived in, as I have, in parts of Africa where there is no electricity and there's no correlation between the benefits of electricity and things like health, things like access to knowledge, things like being able to study at night when the sun goes down and so on, uh, the price that not having electricity places on the lives and the, and the burden of, of people living in, 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 in uh, poor countries um, is just incalculable. And so all of the people who have a high HDI index and are uh, able to have the benefits of health, education, and all the other things, actually are in countries that have mastery over this thing called electricity and to some extent water, waste, water, and roads. That, those are the kind of things you need, to, you need to have, and then you get the communication comes in to support it. And I don't know if in this discussion we've decoupled and reinvented the first world, third world debate, and it worries me deeply, where the electricity deficit of the developing world is completely not understood. Until you've been in, in Tanzania, in Nigeria, in Botswana, in these countries where there is no reliable grid, there is no baseload provision of electricity, where the source of electricity at best is diesel and is sometimes a solar panel with a battery. Um, you know, we've got to think about the ethical consequences of decarbonizing in a world that has to carbonize if we don't find alternative sources. And I think that's a profound question. And I, and I think decarbonizing is a moral imperative provided the developmental challenge of the developing world is not left off the agenda at the same time. Might just add. <laughs> I might just add a really quick comment there, and that is that the climate science community is often uh, misinterpreted as somehow suggesting that uh, electricity should be deprived of the third world and so on, which is just completely ridiculous. Uh, we can, you know, advocate basically scaling the electricity into those developing nations in a sensible way that uh, dim diminishes their reliance on fossil fuels. I, I mean, I can say one thing here for, you know, I heard the question start with the prophecy for 60 years from now. We will look back in 60 years from now and look at ships ferrying coal around the planet and just shake our heads and think, what were we doing back then, moving coal from one place to another and pushing up atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations to these phenomenally high levels. A, a bit like we see a, asbestos being shoveled in a factory and we think, how could they have done that? It's gonna, we will change our view on these technologies. Uh, it will come in several decades and, and I think the important point I wanna make is just that we're all for electricity for the developing nation, just different ways of making that electricity. Thank you. I can't add much to that other than just comment on the education issue and the varying ways of being educated and the sort of really abundant ways of uh, destroying the planet with um, different values and different ideas in education. So it's kind of a critical question to um, develop a, a more uh, aligned and effective uh, educational environment for the whole world to solve fundamental risks, so I'd say. A quick, a quick permacultural perspective question for uh, all or any one of the panel. Um, in Chris's uh, ecological uh, uh, future, which uh, a lot of environmentalists uh, passionately uh, hope will eventuate, um, w will a big factor be um, the issue of moderating uh, the microclimate within our urban uh, planning zones, uh, i.e. Um, how could we use, say, land care principles and permaculture design, rooftop gardening, etc., uh, in an urban uh, agriculture um, uh, environment uh, to alleviate the problems with heat waves, which we've seen uh, only recently, where medical authorities are concerned that a lot of people are going to actually die uh, if we don't uh, drastically redesign our, 
our urban settings along ecological um, ways. I might kick off and say that um, yeah, in, in planning terms, the, um, you know, one of the issues in ecology is developing denser, sustainable cities, safe, sustainable, healthy cities. And a critical part of that is heat sinks and dealing with that, and there's a lot of work going on uh, in the ways we design buildings, in the ways we use landscape, um, rooftops, uh, filtering water, all sorts of things, which are the key, one of the key ingredients for a successful future. I'll give you a couple of, a couple of parts to the answer. First of all, I, uh, what I believe we will see in the next two decades is a systemic reconsideration, uh, a reconsideration of the systems which allow us to survive and thrive in urban areas. And, and, we've, we've, and I, I've learned this from some of my, my peers and my, and my colleagues in Europe, and we're looking at some of our eco-cities around the world, is how to design a city, not based on formalism, but, but, but based on systemic understanding of the requirements of a citizen to thrive. So it's not based upon the, the, uh, the political structure of a city, but based upon the needs structure. Which is a, it's a whole different ball game when you're looking not at the Department of Parks or Roads or Energy, but you're looking at the provision of mobility, the provision of access. And that, to me, also in, in, includes and incorporates the systemic understanding of where your fundamental carbohydrates and proteins come from. And what's the distance they're going to travel, how are they going to be produced. You know, there's a whole lot, there are lots of factors which get wrapped up into an understanding uh, as, as it unwraps itself. So whether um, urban permacultures are part of the equation for Sydney or for Melbourne or for Perth, it, it's hard for me to make a statement like that. But a, a, a fundamental reconsider, a reconsideration of the system of provision has to be part of, of any, any cognizant future. Because of a second thing, which is the connectivity, which you brought up, and this is where what you're bringing up as well, is, is how we are connected. And to me, there's these, like, we're like onions and layers of onions in our connectivity. And we're beginning to understand more and more, again, sort of like in the 60s and 70s, how we are connected to each other. Sort of think, think globally and act lo locally. And as this is coming back, and I think it's not just the internet which allows us this instant access connection, but also enhances our desire to reconnect at P to P person to person. We're seeing now individuals, youngsters, who have a, in some parts of the world, I won't say this is true here, a richer life in the virtual world than they are in the physical world. They can escape into rich virtual environments that are architecturally wonderful. They're with their colleagues and friends from all over the world, and they step out of their bedroom, and they don't have any of it which is a very fascinating what this new connectivity is placing new demands upon our physical environment and our communities as well. And I find that to be a fascinating uh, tension as we begin to look forward, which is a little bit what you asked about. Social consciousness is really only there if you're not trying to get food to survive. And you know, two-thirds of the world's population are just trying to get by. And so I think we we've we've, can't forget that it's not just us and we're wonderfully isolated and terribly isolated here. Right? This, is the, this is the tyranny of distance, which all of us here, all of us, myself included, feel. This is a wonderful advantage and a disadvantage. But we are part of a large system, which is the planet Spaceship Earth. And what happens in Pakistan and Bangladesh is going to impact us, whether we like it or not. And this is a really important thing about that, about that connectivity and social consciousness that we have to consider. I've just got one idea about cities, and that is I think it's retrofitting the city is the first question. Mm. How do you make it a place where we would really want to live? And I think that we've got to take the environmental movement of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, which kind of lives on, which says it's all about my backyard and start talking about our backyard and start to think about a systemic type of retrofitting of the city that makes it a better place to be. And then I think the second uh, half question of, about the city of the future is let's imagine a city where the people running and governing the city are actually allowed to govern the city rather than to govern elements of a city that don't work together. And I think that's a huge challenge. Mm. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it would be video for me to try and uh, 
summarise what's been said tonight. I think it's given us uh, a lot of time for thought. And I think if we're going to move from the selfish sector to the uh, eco sector, then it's in, it's in, uh, in vital on all of us, really, that we've got to take some action. It's not going to happen if we just passively sit by and wait for it to happen, wait for somebody else to do it. I'd like to, if you would join with me to thank our panel and our guest speakers.